Friendship! Friendship! What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is my friend Riley. Uh, this is the guy that's keeping me at gunpoint in his basement to do a review. Liam McKinnon. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And today we... <laughs> Today we are talking about the 1995 film, Seven. Oh, Riley, you asked if we could be able to do this film and to do this, uh, to have this conversation about this movie. I did. Because you, this is one of your favorite films of all time, you've told me. It is, and I mean, kicking off my whole movie critic career, as of right now. <laughs> uh, I first watched this movie with Ricky, and we were, we watched it, and... I noticed it was our first, it was our first time seeing the movie for both of us, and mm -hmm. it Ricky's was a, his friend. Yeah, Ricky's my friend. Shout out to Ricky because you'll be watching this. <laughs> uh, this is like I I watch this movie, and I mean, outside of the whole thing that the director wanted us to see, the the writer wanted us to see was the whole that John Doe is wrath, and no, John Doe is envy, and Brad Pitt is wrath. Mm -hmm. And so here's my theory that I was telling you about earlier that I wanted to get into this. Oh, the theory about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, about. John, what is John Doe's connection to no, no, no. So here, everything? My or theory what? is John Doe is wrath and Brad Pitt's wrath. wife is envy. Brad Pitt's wife is envy. Yes. Jumping right into that. Okay, I am. So, yeah, sorry. Okay. Like, no, it's okay. Yeah, no, but, but like this okay. is, when you asked me why it's my favorite movie and this is kind of why it's my favorite movie. Oh, with this, okay. So this, uh, why this is your favorite movie, this, yeah. this theory is developed. Yeah, because like, and like I yeah. said, like this, I, I, I found this theory, I watched it on my own. Like I watch this movie and like this theory is pretty interesting. Looked it up on Google, and, like, there's actually a big topic about this, so I felt pretty proud of myself. <laughs> there so, you go. Yeah, like, you so, cited, Google sided with you. Yeah, Google sided that. with me, and, like, I mean, that was just a neat movie, and, like, I, I remember thinking about this, and me and Ricky had this argument, and he's like, just shut up, Riley, you're wrong, shut up, Riley, you're wrong, and so he let, he made me think about the movie, like, the entire night, and so I just, it kind of grew on me, and I started to love it. But, uh, so my theory, anyways, sorry, we're jumping right into this, I'm not very good at the whole... Oh, it's okay, yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah. Well, welcome, welcome to the internet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone here is accepting, at least they should be. So yeah, go on. Okay, go on. thank you. Uh, and so, my, my theory is, because we go through this entire movie learning about how John Doe is not just a murderer, and they made, Somerset especially made this very clear that John Doe doesn't just murder because he wants to kill somebody. Like, he's... And th that's why I like the, like the writing so much, like, this is all meticulously planned. And I find it pretty neat that if my theory is correct, that he made this entire movie based on a theory that the audience... Is not actually gonna notice unless they do very deep, like very deep digging. And so I respect the director for this. And so my theory is that John Doe killed Brad Pitt's wife because he got to know her, and like we we meet her for a little bit there, like at the coffee shop with her in Somerset. Mm -hmm. And it was she talked about how she hates the city and how she misses being a teacher and how she's almost envious that she's not living in that city anymore. Like she's envious that she's not gonna give her kid a good life and all this kind of stuff and she's also envious that she's the only one that has to know about the child and she can't tell Brad Pitt about it right now because she doesn't want to upset him and make him you know like stir crazy in his job and so he and so, like John Doe would have known that if he I don't know we don't actually know how he met her and how he actually ended up killing her but if he sat down and talked with her for a bit and we'd learn that she that's the reason why I, I believe the reason why she got killed because out of all these murders she, he doesn't kill anybody for no reason. And it would make no sense to me if he went all his time, killed six of the seven deadly sins, and left one alive in jail. That doesn't make sense to me. So I think he's wrath, and that's why he died. It's because he was wrathful and acted on all these murders, and so that is his deadly sin, is that he's wrathful. So he had Brad Pitt kill him to finish off the job. Oh, okay. And so I don't... I, and I firmly believe, yeah. it drives me nuts, that like he killed six sins... And left one alive in prison, and he just killed. He killed Brad Pitt's wife for no reason, and he wouldn't do that. Right, he wouldn't. Okay, yeah, because he because if he was going into this whole thing, but because he's so methodical and so well thought out, he wouldn't just kill his wife without a purpose. And no, it's not, no. And I, yeah, the movie, and I I understand this. The movies set up for it is the the way that it's letting leading us to believe it's like. And I don't think this is wrong by the movie standpoint, but it's it's like saying, I'm envious of your normal life. And he says he says to, to Mills, it's like, I envy your normal life, David. And he's like, become vengeance, become wrath. So it's like the focus is going on to that. But there is still that chance. I think, I think John Doe knows this, is that there's still that chance that Mills won't kill him. There is that chance that he will hold on to his 
humanity and there's that possibility that he won't kill him. So, if that happens, then the idea of envy and wrath is denied. But, but he, what, if he if he kill if he has that contingency of the envy with Gwyneth Paltrow's character, yeah. like like if she dies with what you said about being envious of, of not being of uh, not having a job or like uh, not having a great home in this in this city, all that stuff, then he has just killed someone who has envy, and then there is the possibility that he in prison will die. He will die either in prison or he will be sent to an electric chair or something after what he's done. I think Mills would probably push for that. So he's making contingencies in case that plan yeah, is a good plan. So even if, so even if like the whole idea of, because you're not you're, with your theory, you're not you're not saying this is the actual true thing. But I, but no, I actually no, I, I understand that. Like, and your theory actually adds more sense, like John Doe's character, just how meticulous he's planned this, yeah, through, like how thoughtful he is about the whole thing. I and mean, even when they get to the scene and like they pull up in the, and, like he asks what time it is and they see that dead dog goes oh, it wasn't me, because he and he doesn't want people to think that he just kills for no reason. Right. <clears throat> yeah. No, I like that. You know what? I like that a lot. No, you. Oh, uh, you mentioned because you you mentioned to me before we watched this movie just now that you had a you had a theory, and that you you were you did what this movie did. You you were adding little details to this to, to what you were saying like you with what you were saying you were saying things about this idea of of Morgan Freeman um, or being, Somerset yeah. Oh, yeah yeah sorry sorry Somerset about him being the person that John Doe paid off or that paid paid John Doe to get in as the reporter and yeah. then he not knowing it was John Doe he just thought it was like another reporter yeah, getting yeah, money yeah. for his retirement so I'm like. Wait a minute. So I start. You got me into this hyper focused moment to try to pay attention to every single thing that was going on in yeah. this movie, and with a David Fincher film that weighs on your brain because David no, Fincher is such a meticulous and, like, director. I didn't want to spoil it for you, but like when when he was on his knees and he like looks at Summer and he's like, "You never told her," and like that's where I'm like, "This is the icing on the cake for this theory that I've the the theory that yeah. that when he says like uh, just for so I can clarify in my own brain is like the theory that. When he says, "It's, it's disturbing how easy someone can get information yes, from absolutely. a person." You think that Somerset is the cop that gave him the yeah, information I, by being paid? I think so, and because like the the first time that we meet John Doe or Kevin Spacey, hate to spoil it for you, but here we are. Anyways, <laughs> uh, they're at the scene with Sloth, I believe, where the the guy that comes back to life and he's like zombified. Yeah, sort of yeah, he's just he yeah. grabbing on that last bit of breath. Yeah, like, yeah, and so. They're outside talking, and then the reporter, John Doe, rushes up, and he takes pictures of them, and he gets kicked out in by Brad Pitt's character, and then Somerset tells him, or Morgan Freeman tells him, that these guys pay good money to cops to get information on the crime scenes, mm -hmm. and since so their first time we meet the reporter, and like I kind of thought, I'm like, how does like Morgan Freeman or Somerset know about this going on? This he's actually done before, and we've seen. With the FBI agent who gives him the library files, that Somerset is he, he has a problem doing this shady going stuff on the, the side, yeah, yeah. going behind the law that he works with, yeah. yeah. And so like, he, like, and that kind of proves to me is like he wouldn't care if he a reporter paid him to come up and take pictures. And so that's my and I believe that Somerset was the reason why he came up and took pictures in the first place. But let's fast forward a bit in the film, like when they were sitting on the where they finally have. Like, Brad Pitt's about to come wrath. And so, like, he... And when they went for coffee, Gwyneth Paltrow and Morgan Freeman, they went for coffee, and she broke the ice, and she told him that she is pregnant, and Brad Pitt's character didn't know about this. So only two characters at the point in the film know about this, right. her and Morgan Freeman. And then we go to the end, and somehow uh, John Doe knows that she's pregnant, mm -hmm. and so either A, he talked to her about it, or B, he got it from Somerset. Right. But he also knew that Somerset knew about the pregnancy. Yeah, I actually think I can put in something from that from uh, not going too much. Because the theory, that theory for me, the, the theory about like the whole Gwyneth Paltrow and Kev being Envy and Kevin Spacey being Wrath, I, I actually can buy with that. Yeah, that yeah. one's actually like chillingly like, holy cow, that makes so much sense with this story. Uh, but with this one, I think that the things that make me not buy into that one too much is just when... When Kevin Spacey says it, like, he says, 
she, like he describes the scene so vividly to get into Mill's head. Like she begged for her life and begged for the baby inside of her. Like everything between Mills and, and John Doe up until that point from when they're driving to the location that they have to go to find these bodies supposedly, they've been jabbing at each other. Everything that they've been saying in that car ride has been a jab at each other, <coughs> keeping just driving the knife deeper and deeper into the loath loathsomeness of their relationship. And when he's saying that, I think it's just like the the cherry on top of that thing, like the baby inside of her. Like he he is doing that because he he suspects that he knows. And like I'm sure, like uh, Tracy said it when uh, she was dying, like when he was torturing her, uh, or when he was torturing her to uh, to ba basically like she divulged that information to maybe spare her life. So I think that's how he came across that information, and he's like, "Oh, I'm going to use this weaponize it." Like, it could be, yeah. And then the look comes from the fact that Morgan uh, it comes from Somerset when he slaps. Oh uh, yeah, I was about to say like when he after he hits him, because then, then he clues in. He's like, "Oh, you hit me," and that's one of those unspoken things that we kind of noticed like with this yeah, movie okay. that's so good. It's like it's an unspoken like he didn't know, but you did, which is why you didn't want me to say anything. And, and th so those moments are just like. Okay, I'm like, those, so those little puzzle pieces there, I'm like, nah, I don't go too much to that. No, that's end. fair, that's fair. But like I do, I do understand the MV and Wrath one. That's actually it's chilling. Like you, yeah, got, like, you that's, know, that's, that's my, my, one of my favorites because like, I thought about this on my own, and it's actually a back up theory in the internet. So. Yeah, this is one of those movies that when I seeing it before, it was something that I wanted to say. My uh, my parents saw this movie in theaters when it came out, and the thing with this movie that. Uh, like, I didn't know this when I first saw it. I just saw it on Netflix. I'm like, oh, it's got Brad Pitt. It's got Morgan Freeman. It sounds like a good watch. Uh, and it freaked me out. I was just like, I didn't pay enough attention to it. I didn't realize the people behind it and what how big a movie this actually was. And in seeing it, <laughs> it like came up. I was like, hey, I just watched this movie, Seven. My mom was like, what? You what? What? Because this is a movie she does not like. She, she hates this movie. Not in terms of just the movie itself, but like she... We'll never watch this movie again after seeing it. No, it's, I mean, that's that's fair. It's I mean, one of those movies where she... And she won't even talk about it. Like, I try to talk about, like, why this movie is so good. Like, the technical stuff and, it, like, the... The, like, the cinematography is amazing. The direction is great. The performance is great. And it's got Brad Pitt. She loves Brad Pitt. I think it's the subject matter that it's... Like... Oh, it's definitely... It's not just that. It's it's the how the subject matter is handled. And that's the stuff that she just turned off from. Uh, and I get that. She's totally different taste than me. Um... Just on the topic of the subject matter, though, because that's something that I realized watching it a, sec a third time now. This is both of our third times. Yeah, so. which is funny enough. It's very funny. Um, seeing it a third time, though, I was shocked with just how disturbed I actually was with violence. Because I've, I've said on a few other videos and just uh, in my personal life that I don't care too much about how violence is depicted in, in media, in, term in terms of, like, entertainment media. Because it's like... I always think that violence serves a purpose and it always has this uh, reason for being. Like, Quentin Tarantino movies have a reason for the violence that is... Yeah, in no, it's, Slasher it's, films have a reason to, for the violence that they're in them. There's something about this violence, though, it's a bit different than, like... But, and it's weird, because there is a purpose for it, but it's so realistic... It is, and, like, and grounded that it's, like... Oh, like, the one in particular was was greed. What, I think what... I just realized that... The thing that gets me is the fact that when we see the image of the guy like turned over in the pictures, and they're actually processing in a realistic scenario. Let's see, a gun is pointing to your head, and you're told that you have to cut off body parts. Yeah. What body parts do you cut off? And then Brad Pitt says, "Well, how about the love handle?" And then shows a picture. And I'm like, "Oh my god, that's right. Oh my god, yeah." Because then, I personally, when I watch movies, I sometimes get myself into this. I get so moved or I get so attached and engaged with movies if they're good that I start to really consider <coughs> things that are being said. This movie is a huge thing with the other things I, I want to talk about but that was one of those moments where I'm like oh my god like I can get that. I feel that. I feel like I would be in that position. If I was in that position that's the logical thing for me to do too and uh, it's just weird thinking that and it, it, it's unsettling. When a movie is, or anything is able to make you think and blur the lines of your No, own. and like, that's, I mean, and that's, <laughs> and I mean, for me in this movie, the most disgust, like the most shocking thing I've watched, or like the most one where it's like, I look at, I'm like, I'm like, this is pretty bad. It was the last one. Yeah. And like, I, 
And the thing about this movie, like, I'll watch, like, when I watch slasher films, or, like, even Saw, for that matter, like, I see bloody, like, blood and shit on the screen, it's like, it doesn't bother me. But this one is more about, like, the intentions behind the killing, and, like, the passion that John Doe has for, like, the murders. That's more the disturbing part. Like, I mean, lust is the most disturbing one, and we don't see anything. There's no blood at all in that, and, like, all we see is the guy's reaction to it, like, the... We see the inside the club, we see... The only things we see are her legs... Like, just her knees, basically, from there. And we see her head, like, the top of it. Yeah. And we see her left hand, I think, is bound, and that's it. That's it. And like, there's, it's... But, I mean, that is the, still the most... That is the one scene, like, if you're gonna watch this movie, and you walk out of that movie, there's two scenes you're gonna remember, in my opinion. Uh, the car ride, and the lust. Like, the guy in the questioning room. Yeah. Those it, are the two that really stick in my head. Yeah, um... The whole, like... It's so interesting, like, the choices made in that direction, like, they're, the fact that the room is all red lit, so, like, it's, like, you don't see blood, but you can, but the fact that the room is red, yeah, like, I you know, just think the whole room is covered in blood. Um, the performance by the guy who's, who's, like, a witness, if anybody ever says that, if I ever hear anybody say, I've got a line and I've only got, like, a few lines in a movie and, like, woe is me, I'm gonna say, you better watch Seven. And you better see just how yeah. much commitment somebody has to one little scene. Because, my gosh, this is one of the best... I think it's one of the best extra moments I've ever seen in any movie. Because... Oh, man. Like, that, I, that, I it mean, feels I like a character about... that's lived in. Like, this is the thing. Movies or, like, people and good performers and good actors, when they really dedicate themselves to something, they feel like a character that's actually lived in like a, a real person yeah, yeah. he feels like a real person yeah it's, it's, it's bizarre it's just like I mean Ooh, yeah. and even when they first see him like when he's in the crime scene like Brad Pitt's like get this guy the hell out of here mm -hmm. I'm like this is just disgusting yeah like, there's, there's uh, uh, yeah <laughs> that rattles me the thing that this is something that I, I, I commend the writing for this movie like um for the I mean I'm a writer I, at least I like dabble into writing I've written I've written plays before I tell people I'm a writer so naturally when other people are writers they want me to read their, yeah, their written work stuff. I, I had somebody give me a script and they, they showed it to me and they it wasn't very good And but they said that there was like a inspiration by the seven deadly sins like just the sins in general like this represents this and this represents this and there's only like two and I feel like that's something that a lot of writers feel like when they, when they want to make a story or have some kind of symbolic meaning of the seven deadly sins they want to like they want to, like, maybe do some kind of meaning or something, but it, for some reason it doesn't work. And in a weird way, I don't think move people who are writing... This is just a thing that I have for when it comes to writers. I don't think people should focus too much on focusing on the seven deadly sins because almost every movie focuses in one way on one of, or maybe all yeah. the seven deadly sins in a weird way. Like, And they don't bring attention to it. And surprisingly enough, this movie is bringing full attention to it but it never feels like... It's never one of those moments where it's like, you get it, it's lust, you get it. Like, it's, it's weird. Like, it's... I don't know what it is. And what I'm trying to get to is... is in dealing with these heavy-handed, you know, really, like, you get it moments of, of symbolism, what the deaths mean, like, what greed, the death of greed means. Of all the, of all the ones that I think it's harder to deal with and harder to write about, I think it is wrath. Of all of the seven deadly sins, wrath to me seems like the most basic and generic of them. Because, you know, gluttony can mean a bunch of things. Lust can mean a bunch of things. You Greed, being greedy for what, you know? Like, it can have so many different meanings, but wrath is just that. It's just rage, it's anger, and it's like, well, how do you make that interesting? And I commend the, the work that is done in this movie because they actually made wrath... Uh, like, uh, lust, I agree is like a scene that stands out, but in terms of just objectively, what is the hardest one to make intriguing and what one really sets into people, I think when you see this movie, I think that Wrath was the one for me that is objectively the best handled in terms of giving a level of intrigue. Like, it's a weird thing. Like, it's, I don't know. This is one of those things where I think about it, like, it could have just been like, Somebody, like, going screaming and punching and stuff, but, like, there's actually genuinely deep emotions and intent behind Wrath that make it so interesting. With all the sins, 
But I'm more no, impressed I, I agree with, with Wrath just, because it could have been just been so boring with that last one. No, and I think, I mean, like, even in turning it back to the vehicle or, like, Morgan Freeman's like, if you are truly sent by higher power and you're not really acting like a martyr if you enjoy this work so much, when he looks at Brad Pitt and he goes, I don't think I enjoy it any more than Mills would enjoy some time alone with me in a cell. <laughs> so, I mean, like, he is kind of admitting the fact that John Doe is kind of admitting the fact that he is not innocent in this case. And so they're, they're both kind of wrathful, but for different reasons. Like, and that's why I don't think he would murder Brad Pitt for being, or like he'd pin Brad Pitt for wrath. Because you don't really see Brad Pitt as being an angry person until... He's more of an emotional person. He's more of an emotional person, and he's only angry when John Doe's in the picture. There, or when the focus is on John Doe. Yes. Like, so he, like, like, he's, like he kicks down his door when he's just thinking about not being able to get in. He's uh, very reactive just to what Somerset feels and says. Like, he's just a re- very reactive person. Yes, and so, and now let's throw it back to the point that you made earlier in the movie. Uh, when you're like, if he, if this plan fails, he doesn't have an envy. Mm-hmm. And so, like, but if his plan failed and he doesn't make Brad Pitt wrath, there's no wrath. Yeah, exactly. So and so, like, I mean... And so he is. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Anyways, it doesn't matter. But yeah, like I mean, it's just, and that's what I mean. Like the wrath is. I guess I agree with you, and I just didn't know about it. But wrath is the most interesting sin in this movie, I think. Yeah, it's. I just think it's. I just really commended the film because when I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, of all these, all these things, like the, all of them are like really well thought out. And what makes me just... This is just me praising the writing of this film. Because they they put they took a ballsy choice and they put Wrath at the end. And they wanted Wrath to be the thing that people walked out of being like, oh my gosh. And they did it in a way that is. Like, there's a reason, like, what's in a box yeah. is such a memorable moment. Because people remember that scene. And they didn't just say... They don't just say, walk out of the film. It's like, oh, and tell people. It's like, how was the ending of Seven? It's like, oh, well, it was good. He got, I mean, the guy was screaming at the end and he was shooting up the place i mean yeah no they remember what was in that scene that led to wrath it's like well so even if people don't think of the theory of like the uh, gwyneth paltrow's envy and all that and they think mostly that uh, kevin spacey is envy and brad well i mean it still works uh, yeah and even if like that's what most people like general audience members will take away from it on a first viewing even if they're thinking that it's like they're going away just thinking what led to wrath and they're leave. They're leaving the audience. They're leaving the. I think this is one of the things that made my mom just like uncomfortable with this. They left the theater, just thinking of just how vile the the choices that were made to lead to that. And that's what, something I I, I can. I, it's not easy to write a movie this dark. No, it it's <laughs> it, it isn't. And like, I mean, Hereditary. Oh, like, I mean, I've her- made a video about that. Yeah, yeah. and Hereditary is great, but I don't think I'd be comfortable in my life. I never saw a movie ever again, just because like the subject matter, really, really well crafted, like really well made, really well, like really well written. Yeah, but, like I don't have to see it ever again. Like it was just so, it was like a one time experience thing. Yeah, but there's something about this movie that I just like. I've, I'm comfortable with watching three times. I think you know what I actually can. This is something that I think I can understand. And leading into this, I think it has to do with the heart in this movie, because. It, with a movie like Hereditary, which I really like, I think it's one of it's I think it's an amazing film in terms yeah. of the quality and everything. The heart in that movie goes away really fast. Like it's it, it shows a really vile, vile side. But yeah, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and Tracy, and even some other members of the cast, they show a genuine love. And yeah, a heart it's, for it's, each other. it's like the moments of levity, like the moments when they're when they're at their home and they're laughing about the subway going around. Like even in these darker moments, they're still laughing about it and there's still moments where you can just kind of relax from the evil relax from the fear and the horror and just kind of say yeah this it's, is like, just it's people like like living a life like it's it's you're you're it's not the fact that you're forgetting all the all the scary things but the parts that make us revisit those things i think are the moments where we have some levity and Sometimes the the gruesome scenes are too much for people, but for like, I think for people like you who like the film a lot, love yeah, it. no, it's it's it's, it's just it's, like you get to come back and you don't you're not just being shown bloody pictures or like smut <laughs> or like gross things. No, all I, the yeah, way for sure. Like it's, I mean, like even yeah, like I never really thought about it, but like even up right before the car scene, they're having a little fun moment, uh, like they're shaving their chest with the mics. Yeah, like and it's pieced out through, and they have a good job, like leaving work. I mean, for the most part, and just like. 
it's just leaving the stuff at work. And so, like, we, we get the lives of them as cops, and we get the lives of them as just normal people. And they, it's pretty spread out throughout the movie, but, like, there's a movie like Hereditary that after the one accident, like, it's... Oh, it's just... Uh, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of lift from yeah. the... Yeah, the I get that. heaviness, I guess. And that makes more sense as to why it's... This movie is so much easier to sit through three times than... Yeah. Something like Hereditary would be. You just said something where it's like the... the this is what I love with Connection 2 is like the personal lives and the pr- professional lives. It's so weird seeing those two lives collide at the end too. I think that's one reason why that scene is also so memorable at the end. Because that's the moment where the lives meet. There yeah. no longer is that separation. I mean like... And, we, and that's why that the tragedy of it. Yeah. And we can see... And I mean like... I'm trying, to, I'm trying to picture why like Morgan Freeman like threw the metronome. Like well, end. that that was I, I can't take credit for this uh, observation. I've wa- I've watched a video on this. It's a video with Cinefix. They analyze a scene uh, in this movie. The metronome is one of those things where it's like a, a sign of contempt, and it's just like one of those things of like could, I'm just listening to the rhythms of life. Like, and that's just what to say. Like he, and he throws it, and that's and that comes right after, in my opinion, the scene that cements this this performance with, from Brad, Brad Pitt being one of the his best performances, if not, for me, his best. But it comes from, because Mills said something to him in the bar in terms of questioning the morals of, questioning Morgan Freeman's character, questioning his values, and questioning everything that he's probably, either everything he's come to believe or everything he wants to believe. And now that metronome is still that thing where he's allowed himself to be lulled into this belief. And him throwing it comes right after that scene. And oh, no, like, yeah, I think it's just one of those things where it's just like he's rattled inside after what he said. I was gonna say like it was like the, for me and like now that makes more sense. But like I was saying that the metronome was just kind of like he was able to like kind of forget about his work and stuff like that and able to go home and sleep and like he was he had his little theory that Brad Pitt that he told like he told Mills and like after that theory kind of got questioned and challenged and like he wasn't able to his his work life kind of crept into his. Personal life. His personal life a little bit more to the point where, like, <coughs> you couldn't really handle it. And it's just kind of, and that's what I mean, like, you asked me, like, who is this murder for? Like, who is John Doe's murder for? Mm-hmm. And, like, I mean, I think it was all for Somerset in the sense. Because he finally broke him on the last. And that, that metronome is a great example about how he changed Somerset and how mm-hmm. he impacted him on his last ever case. Yeah. The whole idea that. Because, uh, yeah, I've. I, after seeing it again, the, the question again of who is this murder for, I think it's, the, that's one of those moments where I was thinking, it's like, it's never really said too much in terms of, the, in terms of the, the film, but when it comes down to it, I think that the whole overarching movie, in terms of what the writer was trying to achieve, this is Somerset's story. He's an individual who is, the basic concept is like, he's a man who hates the city that he's a part of, and he wants to just get out of it and get out of this life. But he's introduced like, to a cop, to a fellow cop who shares opposite opinions, the whole buddy cop scenario. And in the, he meets an antagonist who is the extremities of the things he hates. And also an extremeness of the mental belief in the thought process that he has as, a, uh, as someone who's lived in the city. Like he, he too, just like John Doe, finds the vileness in the city, like there's no good in it. Uh, but he doesn't go to the extremes that John Doe does. Um... So the overarching film is focused on Somerset, and the murders, I think, I don't necessarily think that there is, now, after asking the question and seeing it, I don't think there's necessarily too much of a target until John Doe found Mills. Like, he wanted, he wanted to be remembered for this. He wanted to be remembered in his own way. Like, he wanted to get rid of his own binality and stop being living in this world that was just content where he was content. Yeah. And so, he wanted this to ring true for everyone in the world, like he says that, and he found a target in Mills, and I think Somerset, without him knowing it, was deeply affected by it. And I think he can kind of tell, like in that car scene, the way that Somerset is talking to him. Like, Somerset is genuinely taking in the words that he says. Like, he he isn't just saying, oh, uh, screw you, John Doe, I'm not going to listen to you. He's actually asking him questions, and even when... John Doe asks him, it's like, what do you mean in a moment? He actually says, I'm glad you asked. Like, he's actually taking in the words that he's saying. And I don't, I don't know, there's something, there was just something so interesting with that, and 
how this movie's relationships with the characters is done and all that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, this entire review is turning into, like, how good the writing is in this movie, which is... Well, yeah, is, I mean, because like, I... The, the writing is... I, this I, is I've always tried to, like, I, we've always tried to break down these videos in terms of, like, uh, saying the cons or the pros, whatever we love, whatever we talk about the most is what we focus on in the end, but... I honestly can't think of anything technically that's wrong with no, this No, I, I mean, like, it's... One th I'm just trying to... I mean, like, the entire atmosphere is, like, pretty bleak and depressing. Oh, yeah. That was definitely... Per it that was, was meant for it. And it was stylized. That's the thing. Personally, like, I always try to break movies up in terms of personal things and in terms of objective Yeah, and so, like, things. the fact that I'm saying that now, I think, is what his goal was in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's why people, like your mother, walk out of this movie <laughs> once and they never have to go to it again. Because it is... It's pretty... To sit there and watch this movie and invest yourself is pretty emotionally sometimes draining. I but, felt it seeing it now. Yeah, I was, it was like, like, really was... like, oh, man. Like, th this is one of those movies where I... Even though it's so technically well done, the one personal thing I can say, and why this isn't... It's not uh, a all-time favorite... Like, it's I love the film. Like, if I was going to give it any rating at all, I'd go stars for some reason. If I was going to give it any rating, I'd give it, like, a 4.6 personally, and, like, a 5 technically. But it wouldn't go into that full five for me and be one of those movies where I'm just like, I'm going to watch this all the time, you know? Like, what am I doing? It's Tuesday, uh, it's Tuesday yeah, afternoon, it's what am I doing? Let's pop, pop in, in seven, seven. Yeah. sit down, all right. Uh, like, uh, like, I would, this is a movie that if I wanted to really understand and study how to do a procedural crime film right and not make it tedious and boring, like, uh, like I like how they just get rid of all the exposition in terms of just getting the getting rid of the whole introductions of of john of, of somerset and but you know what i, ha I have to say there isn't a lot of movies that i watch and i'm like i actually enjoyed listening to the exposition yeah, yeah. And, i mean like usually it's like forced down your throat and you're like you have to sit there and listen to it but it never like, i never actually correct me if i'm wrong but there are definitely some scenes in a movie you're like oh this scene so boring you're like kind of like getting lulled to sleep and like like i'm just trying to think do you watch daredevil have you seen which one like the, the television TV series yes, yeah. I have. So I'm in the middle of that right now, and like I, I told this to Ricky when I watched it. There's always two storylines going on, and it's so like there's one storyline that you really invest to, and it's like really action packed. It's like really interesting. Then it goes to this other storyline. Like I don't really care about this one. I have to listen to it anyways. Yeah, I can but, understand that. Yeah. And there was not a single scene in this movie that I ever think that for. Like I'm always, I love every single scene that this like is that is in this movie. Yeah, I can. There is not agree. a throwaway scene that I like. I I watch like why is this in this movie? Why why did the writer put this in there? And it's almost the point where, like, you, you think about it so much that every single line of dialogue you hear in this movie is on throwaway. No, you're, like, no. you're, you're watching it, you're listening to it, you're trying to pick... And you can watch this movie over and over and over again, and you'll find something new every single time. That's the thing that I love with any movie, is, like, when, I, when you watch it, and you're just like, I'm finding... If I had a question... Like, I had so many questions going into this, w with you and with the film itself. And the thing is, I was finding answers... And I found new revelations, new things to discover. Yeah, and like and it's, it's not. I don't think I found everything. Like there's there's stuff in the background I didn't focus on. Like the thing that when we were talking about when when they're talking about that story uh, of Mills shooting his gun for the first time, there's a moment where the sun shines through as if this moment is like there's a light in Mills. Like like there's a light that Morgan Freeman is seeing. And when when you kind of so when you kind of mentioned that to me at first, I'm like I I don't I don't think that was the director's intent. But like if you think about it. Aside from the last scene, like with the whole wrath thing, there is not a lot of natural light in this movie. Mm -hmm. For the most, it's always raining. It's always bleak. It's always. And so I find it kind of bizarre that. I mean, but even like the light at the end, like it wasn't very. It wasn't a very warm light. No, it was, it was very it was harsh. Like, and it was like it was harsh and hot, and like setting hellish and setting. almost. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But that light in the car was actually like it was almost like a sigh of relief because you go through this entire movie and you see no light. Natural light, all you see is, like, these lights that the director manipulated to make you feel a certain way about the scene. But uh, that was a little bit of natural light that actually appeared in the movie, and I find it pretty bizarre that that happened. And, on. I mean, this is a movie, I mean, this was when film, when movies were still shot on film here, so it's like, they edited it, they saw that moment, and they're probably like, eh, let's leave it in the movie. Let's see. And I think what's, and I mean, just very quickly, what you mentioned with the hellish landscape, I, and I agree with you with the whole thing of the, there's a lack of natural lighting, even the ending when the lighting is there, because the sun, with that scene, and again, just realize this, when they're driving by, the sun flashes on Brad Pitt's character when he's going, trying to remember his name. It's a good thing. But then, later with John Doe, when he's, like, sitting crowd on his knees, the sun, I don't know if you notice this, but it's, like, behind John Doe's head. So all of a sudden, this light that was so positive before with, with 
Mills is now glorifying, putting in a glorified stance, a killer, and now that light is now kind of tainted. I mean, I have to watch again, pay attention yeah. to the light, but like, because like a lot of times, and in my opinion, light is always used as like a whole. It's like a cheap shot when it comes to like deep imagery and like you know. What I, I mean? can understand. It's like like when you watch a movie and you're saying there there seems to be a mo- moment where there, there's like a light or something that's like done particularly a different way and you're like oh i see you I see, trying to yeah, make me like, understand symbolism and so like but i mean and i refuse to believe after watching this movie for the third time and how and i i like there's not a thing in this movie the director didn't like look at and touch and make sure it was 100 percent right so i'm gonna have to watch it one more time and i'm gonna have to pay attention to the lights especially mm-hmm. because yeah. whether it was on purpose or not like there's and like you said it's not it's not hard to redo the scene or edit something out and like the fact that he left a little bit of light in there was could be on purpose, could have been like a happy accident. But there was something yeah, I think he wanted something to do with it. Yeah. There at, at least there's got to be some kind of intent cuz I mean like it or not, this movie is technically one of Fincher's best. Like I don't know if how many of Fincher's films you've oh, no. seen. I've seen like I've seen films like Zodiac, I've seen Gone, Gone Girl, I've seen The Social Network. Uh, I uh, no, he didn't do Steve Jobs. Somebody else did. But those those movies that I've seen, Seth, and Fight Club, and I think of all these movies, the ones that I love the most, uh, in terms of their technical creation and just terms of like how impressed I am, because this movie has such simple subject matter. Like it's just again, it seems like it's just a police procedural, but it's with a, more deeper things with the whole Seven Deadly Sins, but. Because of that simpleness, I think it shines through with the technical choices. It's not just a basic film. It could have been. It could have, yeah. It could. But it's so much more than that. And it's, it's so interesting seeing a film like this movie came out in 1995. And still seeing it. And it feels just as fresh as it did when that came, when it, when it would have came out. Like, it's weird that that can happen within a movie like this. I don't know how it's... I, I don't know how it's going to do with a lot with a lot more people, but for me personally, if I'm thinking of just a movie that deals with dark subject matter and still I can watch it like every once in a while just to appreciate it, it's impressive. I mean, like if it's if you're gonna use dark subject matter, you're gonna make the audience oppressed as hell. At least give them a good movie. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> yeah, and like that's and he succeeded in making this, and like that's yeah. what I mean. Like I don't care how depressing it is. I sit down, I get something new from every time I watch it. And I mean, like, same with Hereditary, I'm sure I'll end up watching it at some point, but quite reluctantly, because, like, I mean, like, that that movie was, like, fuck. I mean, was it ever... I sat there, like, holy shit. I'm, like, this is taking so much out of me. Yeah, I agree. And you guys can see how much I agree in my review for Hereditary on this channel. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Just the worst plug, but, no. Um, I Right now, I, I don't know, I... I feel I feel like uh, it's a good place to any because I mean we've covered a lot of things. I, can you think of anything else to talk about right now? Or I mean, I mean like I mean I could talk about this movie for hours, but we'd just be going back to characters were great, writing was great, scene design was great, lighting choices were great, uh, cinematography was amazing, mm-hmm. and the fact that I mean if you if you watch this movie, did we mention Kevin Spacey at all in this? Did we spoil it for them if they haven't seen it yet? Yeah, we, we we talked in depth about the theories in the beginning of this movie. Okay. I think you guys... I'm gonna... Whatever. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Tell it. But, like, it's... I mean, Kevin Spacey. The fact that they can hide him all the way to the end for that final reveal was just, like... You don't see his face. You see nothing. And, I mean, there are some movies where they do a, a, a character reveal. And, like, stepping on the shadows, pulling the hood off, blah, blah, blah. But there was something about his reveal in this movie that was so, so impactful. Yeah. Thank you, Riley. For You're so welcome. much for for sitting down watching this video with me or this movie with me and making this uh, with me, I really appreciate it, man. It's it, it, yeah, I understand why this. When my mom said to me, "I don't understand how anybody can like this as your favorite movie," and you coming here today and talking about it, I I understand now why. Oh, it's it's, can... it's definitely up there, my favorite, top ten for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Riley, for You're coming. You're welcome, It was a blast. Yeah. It was thank, fun. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for coming on and and watching us go through this and find some ground through it we, we really appreciate you guys uh watching this uh, all the way through so 
As always, ladies and gentlemen, uh, leave a comment down below what you think about Seven, what do you think about some of the theories uh, we talked about, some of the little choices in the movie, what do you think, uh, do you like it, do you hate it, does it scare you, does it, do you need to watch Monty Python Flying Circus after it, like I am about to do right now, uh, just leave a comment down below, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and as always, take care.